Welcome to our instructional video on how to collect radiographic measurements from wrist x-rays. The tutorial includes the following measurements as per the Larson method. The first measurement is scapha lunate gap, best visualized in a pencil grip view, which allows you to see the distance between the scaphoid bone and the lunate. You'll want to zoom in so that you can properly visualize the scaphoid and the lunate. Begin by using the annotate tool to draw a circle around the mid-carpal joint. This circle should have the same circumference as the distal articular surface of the proximal row. When you're satisfied with this circle, simply slide it proximally until it lies at the midpoint between the scapha lunate articulation. Lastly, measure point to point at the intersections between the circle and the borders of the scaphoid and the lunate. Here, scapha lunate gap is measured at 1.6 millimeters. Next, we will be measuring the radial axis or the radial reference line. The rest of the measurements in this video will be taken from a lateral x-ray view. You will begin by using your measuring tool to bisect the radius at two points, one at 20 millimeters and another at roughly 70 millimeters from the radial articular surface, as per the Larson method. Bisecting the radius can be particularly difficult if you cannot tell the difference between the cortices of the ulna and the radius. Therefore, we place this second point in a location where the cortices are closely aligned to avoid error in our radial reference line. Once you're satisfied with your two bisectors, use the annotate tool to draw a line connecting the two points, which will now establish your radial reference line. You can remove additional measurements in order to obtain a clearer picture. Use the annotate tool to draw a line along the dorsal cortex of the third metacarpal bone. This will allow you to measure the radio third metacarpal angle or the wrist extension angle to be used later. Here we'll demonstrate how to draw the tangent of the lunate as well as the axes of the scaphoid and the lunate. You'll start by identifying the dorsal and volar poles of the lunate as well as the volar and proximal pole of the scaphoid. Begin by using the annotate tool to draw a line connecting the dorsal and volar poles of the lunate and extending it in the volar direction. And then using the annotate tool to draw a line connecting the proximal and volar poles of the scaphoid. This tangential line forms the long axis of the scaphoid. This is consistent with the Larson method, which describes the scaphoid axis as the tangent of the palmar proximal and palmar distal convexities. The long axis of the scaphoid will be used to conduct subsequent measurements. Next, you'll recall that we drew a line that was tangential to the dorsal and volar poles of the lunate. The Larson method involves drawing a line perpendicular to this, which represents the lunate axis. Both the tangential line and the lunate axis will be used for subsequent measurements. Next, we will be measuring the radiolunate, radioscaphoid, and scapholunate angles. Use the measuring tool to measure the angle between the axis of the radius and the line tangential to the lunate. Subtracting this angle from 90, because 90 is normal, will give you the radiolunate angle. In this case, it would be zero. Now measure the angle between the radial reference line and the long axis of the scaphoid. This acute angle in parentheses will be your radioscaphoid angle. In this case, it is 64.1. Lastly, measure the angle between the axis of the lunate and the long axis of the scaphoid. This will give you the scapholunate angle, and in this case it is measured at 64.6. Next we will discuss the corrected radiolunate and corrected radioscaphoid angles.
The following correction for radiolunate and radioscapoid angles is based on Linscheid and Dobin's recommendation in 1972. When taking x-rays, if the wrist is in dorsiflexion or palmar flexion, there can be a resulting displacement of the carpal bones and especially the scaphoid and the lunate. The angle between the dorsal cortex of the third metacarpal bone and the radial axis is known as the radio third metacarpal angle or wrist extension angle. This can be plugged into the formula for corrected radiolunate angle, which is RLA minus one half of the radio third metacarpal angle, or in this case, 3.6. Similarly, the corrected radioscaphoid angle is RSA plus one half of the radio third metacarpal angle, this time measured at 67.7. The final measurement that we'll be demonstrating is dorsal scaphoid translation, which overall is a useful radiographic parameter for scapholunate dissociation and is associated with post-operative wrist pain. Begin by using the annotate tool to draw a circle around the proximal pole of the scaphoid. The proximal pole should appear round and smooth in contrast with another structure that people often confuse, which is the triquetral tubercle, which has a characteristic ridge. To measure DST, you'll need to find the dorsal lip of the scaphoid facet of the radius. And you'll do that by first identifying a more obvious landmark, the lunate facet of the radius, seen just proximal to the curve of the lunate. Next, you'll trace the radial styloid, which tends to be more palmar, along its length. If we can identify a point that appears to be the dorsal lip of the lunate facet here, you can trace the radial styloid to a point more distal that appears to be the dorsal lip of the scaphoid facet. Once the scaphoid facet of the radius is established, the next step of measuring DST is to translate the radial reference line or radial axis upwards to that point. A normal wrist should have a DST score of zero, which means that your circle is still below the radial reference line that you translated upwards. If your circle around that proximal pole of the scaphoid lies above the radial reference line, this constitutes a positive DST score. Upon zooming in, you can see that our circle intersects with the radial reference line. So we would measure the distance between the highest point of that circle and the radial reference line. This provides a non-zero measurement of DST which in this case is 0.35 millimeters. While it is unclear if DST scores between 0 and 1 are clinically relevant, it is important to pay attention to gross abnormalities. If the proximal pole of the scaphoid appears grossly translated dorsally, and yet you are measuring a DST score of 0 or close to 0, there may have been an error in your measurements. The technique demonstrated here is known as the dorsal tangential lines method. Here is another demonstration of the technique in a wrist that's known to be positive for DST. We begin by drawing the circle around the proximal pole of the scaphoid, tracing the radial styloid, which tends to be more palmar, until you reach the ridge known as the lunate facet of the radius. Here it's just proximal to the lunate curve. And then distal to it is the scaphoid facet of the radius. So we'll translate the reference line upward to the scaphoid facet and use the measuring tool to measure the distance between the top of the circle and the reference line, giving us a value of 4.7, meaning positive for DST. Included here are references for the measurements shown in this video. And that concludes our tutorial.